Eddie Andopu, thank you so much for joining me. You thank are you for having me. One of the 17 uh, global advocates for development goals for the UN. You're in some amazing company. Mia Motley, Justin Trudeau, Brad Smith of Microsoft. What are you bringing to the conversation that wasn't there before? I believe that my presence sort of gives a, it really illuminates the lived experience of people who are from the margins of society and, and bringing those lived experiences into the room where decisions are made. Um, I represent a cross section of society and in some ways I feel a deep obligation to ensure that when we talk about leaving nobody behind, we do so in a way that feels substantive um, and is able to translate into meaningful public policy. I want to dive into that a bit more, but first I want people to understand a bit of your background if they haven't um, encountered you before. Um, you are from Namibia. Uh, at two years old, you were diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy. You weren't expected to make it past five, and now you're... 33. 33 years old? Yeah. What do you attribute that to? A couple of things. I think to the fearlessness and the tenacity of a single mother who invested so much um, into me. Um, and I attribute it also, I think, to receiving opportunity early on. I mean, the ability to be able to attend mainstream education in late 90s Namibia um, was truly a defining moment in my life. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I have a firsthand appreciation for the value of education. When we talk about the importance of education, it, it is deeply felt and it's real because I myself would not be here talking with you had it not been for that early uh, recognition that I too, as a child with a disability, can attain a mainstream education. I know you've talked a lot about the fact that growing up, you were the only child with a disability in school. Has that changed a bit in Namibia in particular and in other emerging economies and also here in the United States and, and uh, developed economies? I think we've seen some progress, but not really enough to move the needle in substantial ways. Um, I think currently the statistics are still abysmal. We're sitting between 90 and 98% of children with disabilities in the global South who've never seen the inside of a classroom. Uh, it remains a travesty of justice. Um, and of course, we are seeing robots uh, in terms of progress. Um, children with disabilities are still excluded and because of the pandemic and because of uh, you know, all of these interlocking challenges that countries are facing, um, we're not seeing adequate investment in inclusive education. Um, and that is across the board, right? And, and so I think really a redoubling of efforts around thinking about what, what does inclusive education really look like in this current sort of world historical moment where, you know, the crises are compounded, right? And, and marginalized communities seem to be um, left behind. So that's an interesting point because obviously as the 78th General Assembly gathers, uh, top of mind is a huge war in Ukraine, yeah. climate change, still knock on impacts of at least financial impacts of COVID. Plus you have many countries in the global South facing crippling sovereign debt. Yeah. How do you make noise to get and break through with this particular issue? And do you feel like you're being heard? Well, I think what tends to happen whenever there is a crisis of global proportion, what tends to happen is that those that are most at risk of being impacted by the crisis tend to be forgotten, right? But then the idea is that, you know, we'll, we'll get to you. Let's solve the global challenges first, and then we'll get to the inclusion stuff, right? Which I think is a really, um, it, it, it's a problematic perspective to have because of course, 
I, I, I think the methodology ought to be if we start with the most vulnerable and, and figure out what they need, then we'll have these positive externalities where we're able to better address the crisis head on, right? So I think it's a question of methodology. I think it's a question of being able to really think about how crises um, often start with those who don't have any kind of social safety net. Um, and so I, I try, my intervention is really around um, being able to make decision makers recognize that the inclusion question is actually at the heart of the questions around how we deal with these, you know, interlocking crises. Again, interesting because this is a common theme in so many of these crises. I remember covering the early days of COVID and hearing directly from the World Health Organization. Actually, once the vaccine is developed, the most important people to get it are the, right. the most vulnerable globally. Right. And that isn't what happened. With climate, the most vulnerable people are those who live in the most impacted areas who tend to be in developing and global southern countries, right? Right. What is it going to take to get the geopolitical will? And who do you think needs to be doing more on the global stage for these issues? Well, I, you know, this might be a crude way of putting this, but I, I think it's, you know, when we recognize that the chickens are coming home to roost, right? When we, when we see these crises on our doorstep, that's when there seems to be vigorous action, right? So when we feel the effects of um, climate change in our backyard, that's when people sort of sit up and pay attention, um, which is, is, I guess, a sad commentary on the lack of global solidarity around these issues, right? And in terms of, you mentioned geopolitics, I think, you know, I, I was listening to the Secretary General's remarks in the general debate, and he stressed the importance of solidarity in the context of these changing geostrategic uh, realignments, right? And, and how um, solidarity is gonna be absolutely critical um, if we're going to make any kind of progress um, on the 2030 agenda. Um, and, and so I, I, I think part of that means looking at the institutions that we are operating within. I, I think that there is, a, there seems to be an appetite for reimagining the global financial architecture. Um, our, our SDG uh, co-chair, uh, Prime Minister Mia Motley, uh, is really at the forefront of, of being able to articulate a new vision um, of what a, a, a reimagined global financial system could look like. Um, but all of these conversations involve, um, I think, really looking at structural uh, changes. Um, it cannot be incrementalism or business as usual as we know it. What one change would you like to see happen immediately to help people with disabilities globally? I think having people with disabilities in leadership positions, right? I think, look, Tony, representation matters. It really does. I think it's not enough to just have people with disabilities as the beneficiaries of international development. I think that people with disabilities need to be leading in organizations, need to be in the driver's seat of international development and really changing the face of leadership as we know it. Um, I look forward to the day when I'm not the only wheelchair user in a given space. Um, I, um, it, it is not lost on me that there is a huge privilege and a responsibility that I hold, um, but at the same time, I will not be doing my job effectively if I continue to be the only one, right? So it's about really expanding, opening up the aperture, ensuring that we're able to have uh, fresh voices, um, fresh faces um, in the decision-making room. Speaking of fresh, Eddie, I love the title of your recently published memoir. Why don't you tell everybody what it is and what it means? It's called Sipping Dom Perignon Through a Straw. And it is equal parts cheeky and incisive. Um, it, it's, you know, the, the title um, really belies a, a much deeper uh, invitation. And that is really, what does the world look like beyond compliance, right? So 
even though I do not, I'm not able to sort of use my hands, um, what, you know, I, I'm insisting on more than the bare minimum. Let's have Dom Perignon through a straw, but let's also have people with disabilities being able to move um, through spaces effortlessly, ensuring that people with disabilities are able to access not just the built environment, but all of social life, all of uh, the things that make life worth living. Eddie, thank you so much and have a great rest of the assembly and good luck to you. Thank you, Tony.